You guys may have noticed that the cost of living is continuing to go up, as it always does. And, uh, it, you know, it ne almost never goes down unless there's a depression or something. So I think it's time we talked about the truth of the cost of living. What's really involved? What drives it? See, in, in, in this country especially, but also in anywhere where there's a capitalist market-based system, they treat it as if it's some law of nature, you know? Like, oh, it's just the gods of capitalism magically raise prices when it's necessary, magically lower them when it's necessary. We worship thy god of capitalism. That seems to be how, you know, we go about doing this. But the fact is, all costs, all prices that are set are totally, 100% arbitrary. They are set by the private owners of the means of production because they want to maximize their own profits and they don't care what happens to the rest of the people. They don't care what happens to the environment. They don't care about anything other than, I want more money for me. That's it. That's why they love markets so much. That's why they keep using their influence in the media and with the politicians and in our education, in our entertainment, to teach us about free market fundamentalism because it benefits them. Markets don't exist without people. They're, the market is not some sentient or even spiritual being that's all-knowing and all-powerful. That's just not the case. Without people to conceive of markets, there's no one to participate in markets to make them go around. And it works basically like this. Markets start when somebody wants to make a profit. Generally, they have to invest something up front, and then you have to get other people to participate, to buy what you want to sell, or in, you know, first case, to produce what you want produced so you can sell it back at a profit. But that means you have to have the money first. And then when somebody comes and, do and offers to do the work, you're like, okay, I'm paying you X to produce this. And they say, well, I don't want X, I want Y. And you say, well then, good luck to you. And the next person comes along and they accept X, whatever that might be. They produce. And the owner says, now the product is mine to sell as I please. And they set the price. Let's say it costs, oh, I don't know, gosh, what? Let's say the product costs about $5 to, uh, to actually produce. And then the, the, the owner says, okay, I'm going to sell this at $50. That, that gives me a $45 profit. Well, wait a minute, what about the person who produced it, or the people who produced it? Well, they don't want anything cutting into their profits, right? So basically, they say, okay, X equals, say, $10, all right? Well, basically, $5 to produce, $10 to pay, that's $15 cut into the total profits. So if he sells it at $50, he's only getting $35. Oh, I don't want that, I want more money. All right, so basically... They outsource the job, and they go to, say, Bangladesh. Okay, instead of paying five, I'll pay you one dollar. Well, five dollars to actually produce, one dollar just to pay the person, six dollars cutting into a, an otherwise, you know, fifty dollar profit. Wow, that's, 50, that's uh, forty-four dollars compared to the thirty-five he had before. Nice, right? The decisions to, to, uh, to manipulate markets are totally arbitrary based on the ownership. It's not based on the worker, as long as you can go somewhere where labor unions are either non-existent or very small, and you can propagandize the public enough using your wealth and your influence to make sure that they don't realize the power they have. I mean, all this started in the United States back in the 1940s, 1945, 46 to be exact, when FDR passed away because the result of the New Deal was stronger labor unions, higher wages, higher standard of living for the people, and the, the wealthy elites weren't allowed to be as rich and powerful as they wanted to be. So, they, put, they pumped their propaganda machine out there. And over the decades that ensued, the working class became more and more divided. They fell for the Red Scare tactics. Everything that wasn't associated with what the capitalists wanted, people began to eventually recognize that in their minds as communism and evil and demonic and, e and devilish and wrong. And that was to their de detriment because the rich just got richer and they kept getting the short end of the stick. And it really, really culminated as far as the New Deal was concerned with the union busting under Reagan. 
So, uh, and what happened there? The cost of living began to go up because the, the private owners had more say over the economy. The workers had less bargaining power because they gave it up due to the propaganda. So, let's say a home cost $100,000 back in the day, and you had a wage that could pay for that over a few years. Well, the owner class didn't want that. So, more of these private equity firms, these, these real estate companies and Wall Street speculators boosted the price as they started investing in homes and, and rental properties and everything else. And a $100 home, you know, basically became a $200,000 home, then a $300,000 a $300, home, $500,000, a million, two million. And the price kept going up. Wages either remained flatlined or in some cases went down when you, entered the, when you uh, introduced the gig economy. So... You can see the tricks being played here, right? The cost of living is all tied to the arbitrary decisions made by the owner class. And as long as the workers realize, that, keep thinking to themselves, oh, well, that's just the law of nature. I have no bargaining power. I just want to do whatever I want to do. And, you know, whatever they say goes and I can make something of it. They're fooling themselves. They are 100% fooling themselves. And... We need to really take charge of the economy in order to change the, our circumstance and to keep the cost of living at a manageable level. Because if the, if the means of production are, bet, are more owned by the working class, you have more co-ops, you have more unions, you're able to keep prices down, you're able to keep wages as high as possible without basically resulting in losses everywhere, well then you've got a system that's balanced and that works. And works for everybody and not just... You know, not th just the rich and powerful, but let's face it, the rich and powerful want it all. They don't want to have to pay us anything, which is why I say, and I'm, I'm kind of contradicting one of my favorite economists, Professor Richard Wolff, when I say this, and that is that slavery is the most extreme form of capitalism. Why do I say that? Because it's essentially zero investment with the slave, because you don't have to pay the slave. All the profits and the products generated by the slave is owned by you, the master, and you get to trade it however you want to another owner, and the slaves get nothing. That's the ultimate form of capitalism. Now, feudalism, of course, was slightly different because the serfs did make a little bit, but still the majority of what they produced and what they made went to the landlord. And so with that in mind, you know, landlords came from feudalism, and we still have them today in the form of, you know, rental properties, which come now in the form of either a private landlord or a private equity firm, or a bank, and they just love to jack the price up for their shareholders, and that's unacceptable, not to mention their own coffers, which forces the rest of the people to be profit-driven as well, because they know they have to meet the arbitrary whims of the people who hold uh, the, basically their standard of living over their head. And again, that's unacceptable. That's not freedom. That is a coercive system. Capitalism is a coercive system. So in order to capture this economy, in order to keep in check the cost of living, we have to have more democracy in the workplace, period. We've got to have better wages. We've got to have better regulations and oversight and management of our public utilities, of the means of production. We have to have more say over what happens in that, in that area, how we sell them, why we sell them, the means by which we sell them, because more and more people are wanting to work from home now. So if you want to produce something, you're going to have to take advantage of, well, we want to stay at home. Let's have more delivery service. That's going to be a thing regardless. So there you go. You have to find a way um, of maximizing you know, the profits, yet still pay people a living wage, and, and, and just leave room for innovation so you can move with the changing of the tide. You know, Stop trying to keep everything in stasis. Keeping everything in stasis is a death sentence particularly for workers. Uh, so the truth about the cost of living is that, you know, it's not some law of nature. It's all arbitrary. It's all determined by, in this capitalist system, the rich and powerful, the owner class, those who own the means of production. Everything we do, everything we're forced to do from our education, say you must pick a job, you must pick a career path and follow it. That's all done to benefit the rich. And this is to say nothing about markets because markets... They exist to serve the rich, too. They were invented by the rich to serve the rich. We, on the other hand, are forced by their coercive tactics to participate in a market-based system. 
Now, we may think that that's freedom, but markets are not freedom because consumers and workers have very little bargaining power in a market-based system. But while mark some markets are definitely a good thing, you know, you don't want government owning any everything, of course not. Public ownership of the means of production is not the same as government ownership because public means workers and consumers. The Green Bay Packers is a good example of a consumer co-op. Worker co-ops like um, Ocean Spray, the cranberry company, you know, they do well every time they, they put their products out there, a uh, certain time of year, of course, we all know that. Their cranberries are freaking awesome. And their workers make make pretty good money, they have a good standard of living. And then you look at Gravity Payments, owned by Dan Price. He was approached by one of his workers who said, you know, if you pay workers a, a livable wage, watch how everything turns around for us and in turn maximizes profits for you. And he, I don't know how he did it, man, but he took it to heart and he started paying his workers a minimum of 70000 a year. His whole workforce is happier now. They have a higher standard of living. His business is booming. That's how it works. When workers make more, they can spend more, and that grows the economy. So more democracy in the workplace is key to keep to lowering the, the uh, cost of living, or at least managing it properly. You know, you want housing to be affordable. You have to have more um, more tenant co-ops, more homeowners owner co-ops. Um, although. You know, there is something to be said about, gov about government oversight in this regard, and that condo collapse in Florida is a good example of that. But private ownership, you know, it, with, with some exceptions, is just recipe for disaster when it comes to the key aspects of society. Healthcare, infrastructure, education, obviously the military and police and firefighting, you don't want that privatized. You know, food is a little different, clothing, a little different. I mean, I don't want the government making my food, I, but I don't want private owners putting chemicals in my food either. You know, so th there's some debate yet to be had about that. Uh, but also uh, housing, of course, because housing is a fundamental need of all people. You know, you got to have shelter. you got to protect yourself from the elements. And um, we got to find a way to keep the prices down. And for, one of the things we can do is get rid of housing trading on the stock market, outlaw the trading of housing on the stock market in the form of the mortgage-backed security invented by Louis Ranieri in 1977 at Solomon Brothers. That was really, I think, the catalyst that led to the housing crash in 2007-2008. And uh, it's one of the things that's still going on in the stock market right now. And uh, those, ty those type of risky, uh, scam-ridden financial products just need to be totally banned. And... Uh, Housing prices need to be kept in check. You know, we could follow the example of um, maybe France or Australia, create a civilian commission to, to look at the cost of everything and the cost of living, of housing and everything, and then use lobbying efforts to go to the government and say, hey, we need to increase wages to match these the housing costs here, or we need to cap housing prices here because of this happening and so on. There are ways we can do this. But the truth about uh, the cost of living, it's controlled by the rich to serve the rich, which forces, forces us into indentured servitude, and that's not fair. That is not a good way to live. It's a coercive system. So we need, we need to get on this, man. We really need to um, get the cost of living under control in this country if we want to have any shot of making life better for everybody here.